And we're absolutely delighted that uh, Mike Hume has agreed to give the lecture this year. Uh, doubly delighted because Mike is also the uh, uh, chair of our advisory committee for the STEP Centre and we very much value his input. But more importantly, for, for the purposes of the uh, lecture today, Mike is the author of a whole array of different books and papers on this subject. Mike comes from a climate science background, but has moved over time to be thinking about science policy questions, uh, and is now the uh, Professor of Climate and Culture in the Department of Geography at King's College. His latest book is called Can Science Fix Climate Change? A, Ken a Case Against Climate Engineering. And he's also working on a book, Cultured Weather, the Idea of Climate and What We Do With It. But many of you will know his book, uh, Why We Disagree About Climate Change, which had a profound impact on the debate. Uh, and he is going to be discussing why we're still disagreeing about climate change and, key point, some of the ways forward. So thank you, Mike. Thanks very much, Ian, and uh, it's always good to be down here in Sussex. Uh, I think probably my second uh, intellectual home now uh, in, in, in the UK, certainly. Um, not just in the frequency of visits down here, but certainly the inspiration that my own thinking around climate change has gathered from many of the people uh, that are here in ADS and Screw, particularly, of course, concentrated through the Step Centre. Um, so, yeah, still disagreeing about climate change, what way forward? Um, so, obviously my argument uh, has been that climate change is an idea that is changing the world. It's changing the world physically through the atmosphere and the physical processes of the planet. But also it's an idea that's changing our political and cultural world. It's an idea that's powerful in the human imagination and therefore it finds expression in lots of different uh, cultural forms and manifestations as it travels around the world and encounters a new places uh, and new people, uh, new ideologies, new hopes, new aspirations, new fears. Uh, and in my book a few years ago I explored some of these reasons of disagreement about what we should do with this idea of climate change. Um, and of course since the publication of that several years ago, six years ago now, many things have happened uh, in the world of climate science, in the world of climate politics, uh, in the world of economics, in the world of culture, uh, and so on. Uh, and what I'm going to do then is to try to pick up the story, uh, if you like, from, uh, from that book, Why We Disagree About Climate Change, uh, and uh, to reflect a little bit on what I've been thinking about uh, over these uh, latter years. Um, and in particular, uh, as he had hinted, what then actually does this tell us about action in the world uh, and what responsibilities uh, we may have to act in the world. And what I'm going to be uh, offering at the end of the talk uh, uh, is an argument that uh, it suggests that we should be putting uh, our investment uh, into the preconditions for making the world that we want. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, which, in more simple terms, is actually a focus on means and not a focus on ends. Okay, so that's where I'm going to be ending up um, the, uh, the story of this lecture. Uh, we'll see how many of you uh, I can carry with me along the way, um, or indeed at the end, uh, how many of you indeed want to challenge uh, my conclusion. I start off with the idea of climate change, and this is certainly one of the ways in which I uh, now talk about climate change. It is as much an idea uh, of the human mind as it is a discovery of scientific method. Um, uh, and I like to refer to this little book, actually, by an environmental historian, Yusin Boyer, a few years ago, ten years ago, called Weather and Imagination, uh, who I think understood some of the cultural uh, dimensions of climate and its changes. Uh, well before many of the rest of us did, and, and in one of the quotes here, he says that yes, there are physical changes, of course, that are going on in the climate system, and humans are now deeply implicated, uh, for sure, in those questions. But actually what this means for us is a cultural and a 
social phenomena. And therefore, it's got historical uh, depth uh, and it's got political context. And that was what I was wanting to explore in my book. Uh, this is uh, one of the, the, the quotes I uh, offered uh, from 2009. It mobilizes different sets of ideologies, meanings, values, and goals. It means different things to different people in different contexts, places, and networks. Uh, and that was what I explored uh, in the book, and I exposed um, these seven different uh, reasons, these meta-reasons, if you will, about why uh, people disagree about climate change uh, and what should be done about it. Different understandings of the role of science in public life, uh, different uh, ways of economic valuation or valuation in general, different religious beliefs and ideologies, different perceptions of risk, different ways in which we communicate with each other collectively, different notions of human well-being and development, uh, and different notions of what might constitute good governance. And I uh, work through those uh, in turn in, in the book. Uh, and many things, of course, as I say, have happened since then, but climate change remains, at least in the words of The Guardian, it remains the biggest story in the world, to quote their recent uh, uh, campaigning position uh, over the last few months, the biggest story in the world. So it still retains this convening and mobilizing power, not just here in the UK, but I would argue right the way across uh, our planet. And the, the, the key position, the key reason that I wanted to uh, open up this uh, in, in my book was of course a disagreement and exploring and understanding the reasons for disagreement is essential if we are going to act politically in the world. It's essential for, for human learning. Uh, I heard a couple of quotes um, just to emphasize the argument um, that I was making uh, here. Uh, again, the honest disagreement is often a good sign of progress. Actually, we have to expose the reasons for disagreement before we can actually discuss and decide how to act in the world. Uh, and my sense was from 10 years ago that uh, not all voices in the debate around climate change, certainly from while I was sitting uh, inside climate science uh, and alongside climate policy, not all the voices in the debate were being honest about the reasons for disagreement. And so I wanted to put those uh, out there openly um, as a contribution to a progressive politics of climate change. Of course, some of the criticism and reaction to that book was that I was doing just the opposite. That by exposing the reasons for disagreement, you're putting obstacles in the way of progressive politics. You're siding with those who are obstructionist, or you're uh, taking the rug away from political action by challenging some of the assumptions of science. And so the book received a variety of uh, reactions. However, I stand by uh, what I was seeking to do, uh, and I would still <coughs> argue that this is an essential process, this uh, unveiling, this articulating of reasons for disagreement we have to go through. So what am I going to do in this lecture? I'm going to do these four, or go through these four steps um, in this talk, uh, <coughs> starting off with uh, what it is that science around climate change can or cannot tell us. My argument is that climate risks uh, are underdetermined by science, and indeed always will be underdetermined by science. I want then to say that uh, uh, in, the, in the light of that, but actually more generally, we have to pass judgment on the facts, whatever those facts might be. Uh, if you will, nature, pure nature, whatever that might be, can never be uh, our moral or our political guide. And having passed judgment on the facts, then our goals will be exposed, and they will be multivariate, and they will be conflicting. Uh, and we have to give uh, visibility to those. And then my final point, as I've uh, hinted then, is it seems to me, uh, and this is the way I've been thinking at least, um, uh, is that we have to invest more in uh, ensuring and developing the preconditions for making the world we want, uh, rather than uh, shouting about the ends. Okay, so uh, that's the outline uh, of, of the lecture. And uh, let's 
uh, uh, let's see how we go. So the risks of climate are underdetermined uh, by science. Again, this is something that I've written uh, uh, quite extensively about in, in recent years. Uh, the dangers, as I call it, of climate reductionism, uh, on the one hand. Uh, that the whole enterprise uh, of climate change research um, is in danger of uh, elevating climate as the primary driver and determinant of the future. The future becomes climate shaped, the idea of climate exceptionalism. Climate somehow has this determining power that imposes itself on how our future will uh, unfold. Um, and one can look at a whole variety of different types of climate impact studies, uh, which look 10, 50, 100 years into the future, um, and does very clever and sophisticated things about what climates are going to do over that period of time, but pay no attention at all to what else might be happening in the human world, in terms of politics, in terms of technologies, in terms of values, uh, in terms of communications, and so on. That's what I mean by climate reductionism. Um, the fact that the risks are undetermined by science uh, means that, of course, none of those other human conditions and change in the world uh, can be modelled uh, inside c computer models by a mathematical formulation. Uh, you, you'll not find a global system model uh, of how the political system will be look, looking in 100 years' time. You will not have a global model of what's going to happen to uh, medical technology or biotechnology in a hundred years time and so the risks uh, despite the heroic efforts of many scientists and researchers gathered together and under uh, assessments like the IPCC these risks will always be underdetermined and because of that there are also then dangers of promoting at least promoting aggressively the idea of a knowledge consensus around climate change. Particularly when that knowledge consensus is made around claims to do with the future. Uh, and so, again, this is something I've written on myself, that the IPCC, in pushing the, uh, the consensual way of representing uh, uh, climate knowledge, uh, might actually be uh, uh, becoming rather blind to some of the alternative uh, ways and possibilities in, in which the future uh, might unfold. And of course, this drive for knowledge consensus comes out of a very particular interpretation or view of how science and policy should or do interact. This is headed out from The Guardian a few years ago, captured it very nicely. <coughs> On the front page of the newspaper after the fourth assessment report was published, the UN's vast report will end the scientific argument, now will the world act, as though somehow getting clear, agreed, consensual knowledge about the climatic future paves the way for political action uh, in the world. Or more recently, the arguments around the consensus gap, this notion that 97.1% of knowledgeable experts believe that humans are having a significant influence on the climate system, whereas if you ask members of the public, at least the American public, only 55% of them will say that 97.1% of scientists agree about that. And the real problem in climate politics is that 55 is not 97. If 55 could become closer to 97, then somehow the politics of climate change would become an awful lot easier. And I'm suggesting that actually is not the case at all. Um, for a whole variety of reasons, at a very fundamental level, of course, the 97.1% consensus is simply about the rather unspectacular claim that humans are having a significant influence on the climate system. It doesn't actually tell us anything about what these risks in the future are going to look like and what they're going to mean. So there are dangers of pushing too aggressively uh, on the notion of a knowledge consensus, or as we'll come back to later on in the talk, uh, the notion that all scientists speak with one voice. Now, having said that, um, it is interesting to notice in the last assessment report of the IPCC, the fifth assessment published last year, 
certainly in some of the communicative uh, materials around that report, uh, particularly around working group two on the impacts and adaptation of climate change, that uh, quite a lot of this was being presented much more explicitly than the IPCC had previously done in terms of risk. Uh, so here Chris Field, who was co-chair of Working Group 2 of the IPCC, characterizing climate change as a challenge in managing risks opens doors to a wide range of options for solutions. So one can see here in the meta-language uh, uh, around which the, some of the IPCC knowledge uh, has been communicated more recently, um, uh, 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 standing back a, a little, stepping away from uh, this notion of clear, decisive, uh, consensual uh, uh, knowledge, the recognition that there are risks and these risks are uh, indeterminate. Now, of course, risk itself is a, uh, a slippery uh, idea uh, and, and uh, you know, it, it works alongside other uh, descriptions uh, of uncertain knowledge. Um, but I think it's just interesting to make this observation as we pass through this part of my talk that thinking of climate change in terms of risks at least begins to open up these spaces for thinking of a variety of ways in which we might attend to these risks. It opens up these spaces for different judgments to be made from different political and ethical uh, uh, reasonings about what might be appropriate courses of action in order to ameliorate or to tolerate these risks. Um, and we know from work like uh, Douglas and Wodowski and the Sculpture Culture Theory and many others <coughs> following uh, uh, along that the ways in which different communities and cultures engage with risk and act upon risk uh, is multivariate. And this move somewhat in this direction, at least in the IPCC, um, uh, means that actually we can begin to challenge more effectively, I think, the uh, conveying uh, conventional uh, narrative that has emerged around climate change over the last 30 years. And here I caric caricature this in terms of what Dan Sarowitz uh, at Arizona State University has referred to as the plan, the standard account of how climate change is going to be effectively dealt with. And for, for, for Sarowitz, the two key elements of the plan have been that science will compel a convergence of worldviews, this idea that science is the decisive uh, voice from outside that will drive people together, particularly if that uh, scientific voice is consensual uh, and singular. Uh, and the second part of the plan for Sarowitz is that the action that will tame climate change will be nationally negotiated um, greenhouse gas emissions reductions on the drugs and timetables uh, type machinery. That certainly is how many of the uh, debates uh, and assumptions of the 1990s and the 2000s uh, evolved on the back of uh, these uh, implicit uh, conventions. Uh, perhaps one could observe over the last few years, certainly since Copenhagen, that maybe some of uh, uh, these uh, conventions have been challenged in a number of different ways. But nevertheless, there's still lurking, I, I think, the uh, resonance uh, of this, uh, uh, this conventional narrative around climate change. Uh, and a good exploration for those who are interested, this book published just last year by Josh Howe uh, called Behind the Curve, Science and the Politics of Global Warming, for an, for an Amer American historian of science, it actually charts very nicely how climate change in American uh, culture came to be framed in the way it did. He starts his narrative in the 1950s and brings it right the way through to the 1990s in a way explaining how the plan uh, of dealing with climate change it came to take on the form and shape uh, that it did. And of course, as all good, good, good historians uh, will reveal, uh, is, that, is that it didn't have to be like that. There were contingencies along the way that pushed the plan in this particular direction, uh, but how it uh, opens up um, uh, uh, ways of thinking and, and realizing and appreciating that actually climate change could have come to be framed in very different ways. Okay, so those are some remarks then about my first point, which is the notion that climate risks are underdetermined. They are underdetermined by science now, today, and they'll be underdetermined by science in five years' time and indeed in 20 years' time. <coughs> On the other hand? Yeah, I was just wondering what 
mean by undetermined? Not known. <laughs> and, and, and not known in the sense that there are certain requirements for knowing the risks that are not knowable. So when we're thinking about what is the risk, what is the risk of climate change for um, mangrove wetlands in Southeast Asia in 50 years' time? How do we know what the risks of climate change are for mangrove wetlands in Southeast Asia in 50 years' time? You're not going to find the answer to that by turning the handles on Earth system models. No matter how sophisticated or how uh, well represented those models are of the climate system, and of course they're deficient in any case of their representation of the climate system, just turning the handle on those models will not identify what the risks are for mangrove wetlands in Southeast Asia, because those risks are a function uh, of the unfolding story of human development, which brings into play uh, human will, uh, politics, ethics, cultures, and all those other things that cannot be represented in the mathematics of these models. Yeah? Do we have to know what the effects would be in, in 50 years in the future, which I agree is probably impossible, we can't predict the future, in order to know what we should be doing today with regards to bring that submission? Well, that's where I'm ending up, do we? That's the key question. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you confusing, I'm not confusing, but would you rather have underdetermined or non-determined? It's always, everyone will always be underdetermined. Is it better to have some degree of determination rather than, I mean, you're painting it almost as if it's underdetermined, therefore means that it's no better than non than actually undetermined. For example, mango spot, sea level rise, the direction of sea level rise is pretty clear. I don't know how to do it. The magnitude is uncertain, the direction, I personally put my house on. But it's still underdetermined in the sense that we yes. cannot determine what those risks will be for mangrove weapons. It's underdetermined, but underdetermined is not the same as undetermined. It's just undetermined. No, which is why I'm not using undetermined. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but uh, if, excuse me, if we can just hold these, I mean, these are good questions, if, and, and if there are particular. It's an emphasis, isn't it? I agree with you. Let's uh, leave that to the end so of the next talk. So there'll be plenty of chance to, to, yeah. to, no, to, to, to challenge loads, me then. Loads of chance at the end. We won't <laughs> let him run away. <laughs> okay, so my second, my second uh, uh, section then here is to draw attention to the need, therefore, for uh, humans to pass judgment on the facts. Whatever these facts are that come out of climate science, whether they're non-determined, underdetermined, or undetermined, we actually have to pass judgments uh, on these uh, facts. And the point is that here I quote from the ex team chair of the IPCC from last year, uh, Pachari, in the launch of the synthesis report of the IPCC, um, when he said in the press conference that all we need is the will to change, which we trust will be motivated by an understanding of the science of climate change. Or, again from last year at the AAAS meeting, the uh, American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science at their annual uh, conference last year, in, in one of the statements that came out of the meeting, a call for decisive political action on climate change, on the basis of what we know. And my point here about using these two examples uh, is to challenge these because simply understanding climate science is not going to be a sufficient basis for action in the world. And simply explaining what we know does not actually get us close to what is the decisive action that is being called for. There are many decisive actions that could be commensurate with what is known, with these underdetermined climate risks. So the point here is that uh, uh, the danger is that a lot of this is empty rhetoric. The rhetoric for decisive action, that all, of, all we need is better communication of climate science, great clarity on what these risks are. For me, a lot of this uh, ends up actually um, not confronting what really actually are the key and contested choices uh, about what these actions uh, might be. And of course, 
if we wanted to take this into a more philosophical uh, reflection, uh, it would be in the direction there of actually where uh, and what does provide our basis for ethical and moral uh, action in the world. Nature, whatever nature might be now, given that humans themselves, of course, are clearly uh, emergent and participating in the way in which nature functions. What actually does it mean, anyway, to say that nature is our moral or our ethical guide? Uh, Sam Harris's book, The Moral Landscape, How Science Determines Human Values, published a few years ago, uh, is a book that I want to uh, question and challenge. I do not think that science actually does determine uh, moral action in the world. Or to put it differently, you cannot read from the pages of the IPCC's fifth assessment report what to do about climate change. The facts as assessed by the IPCC, are not sufficient in themselves in order to know what to do. There has to be an intervention made by human actors uh, to take those facts and to, to decide what they mean and therefore to decide how to take action in the world. And so actually this whole thing about meaning then becomes quite critical. Again, something that I've written about, and actually there are two books, just well, one came out last year, the other one due out very shortly, that tell the story of climate change very much through this lens of meaning. What does climate change mean? And how do different communities around the world establish what it means? Uh, Candice Callison's book, uh, How Climate Change Comes to Matter, A Communal Life of Facts, or, or Philip Smith and Nicholas Howe, uh, shortly being published, Climate Change, a Social Drama. So these big books are drawing attention to this critical stage, this critical process that, that humans, individually or collectively and socially, have got to go through. What does climate change mean, and how do we establish uh, what that meaning is? Or we could put this differently if we go back to looking at Terra Arendi, <coughs> for example, in the way in which she understood political action in the world, in, in the human condition from uh, 50 or more years ago now. Each individual has got to pass judgment on the facts before they can act politically. Or here she puts it, the question is only whether we wish to use our new scientific and technical knowledge in this or in that direction. And this question cannot be determined by scientific means. It is a political question of the first order and therefore can hardly be left to the decision of professional scientists or professional politicians. This is what I mean by the necessity of passing judgment on the facts. Uh, and so this takes me uh, in uh, a, a little uh, Diversion now just to uh, elaborate what some of these different judgments might be or what some of these different meanings might be. And I do this using the idea of the syn synecdoche, uh, this idea of, 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 of replacive speech or a figure of speech. What does climate change stand for when it gets talked about in different public uh, and social uh, contexts? A, a synecdoche or a metonymy is a replacive speech words that are standing in for something else. It's a little bit what I was uh, struggling towards when I uh, used the rather clumsy distinction between lowercase climate change and uppercase climate change uh, in my book. Uh, and so just to offer uh, four of these uh, possibilities very briefly, um, climate change that stands in for is shorthand for risk society, this notion that Beck and Giddens and others have drawn our attention to about the type of society in which we now live, which is obsessed, and which is confronted with risks uh, behind and in front, to the left and to the right. Or as Beck uh, put it here, um, Expected risks are the whip to keep the present in line. The more threatening the shadows that fall on the present, the more believed are the headlines provoked by the dramatization of risk today. Climate change, I think, fits very well into uh, this type of 
ideology. The threatening shadows of a future, a future of climate risk, these threatening shadows circulate here, now, today. Uh, and so we find these ideas, these technologies, these imaginaries of geoengineering, of climate engineering, of taking control decisively through our technology. We can control the planet in order to head off these threatening shadows of the future. This is high modernity or high modernism uh, in its uh, greatest manifestation. Well, maybe climate change is synecdoche for the loss of nature. This is what Bill McKibben uh, was uh, paying our attention to back in 1989 in his book, The End of Nature, uh, where he used climate change uh, as the final lament for the passing of a natural world that was pure and untainted <coughs> by human action. Now the atmosphere, the farther reaches of the whole atmosphere, feel the force and the presence. It was uh, uh, Ian McEwan famously had put it, the hot breath of human civilization. So there's nowhere left now that one can go that is natural. It's put very nicely in this campaigning literature for the Camp for Climate Action a few years ago. Not long ago we knew the best time for planting seeds, when the leaves would turn deep orange, when to look forward to building snowmen. There was a kind of certainty to our lives, but the cuckoos are disappearing, and it seems all the patterns of the world are being scrambled. For the first time, we can not, no longer take the planet's ecosystems for granted. Okay, so here, this is climate change as a synecdoche for the loss or the end of nature, of something passing. Or well, climate change <coughs> as uh, an explicit um, ideology, or at least a resource in order to challenge uh, a particular ideology. So really what climate change is about, when we talk about climate change, we are talking about uh, <coughs> the uh, outcome of a neoliberal capitalist world order. Uh, so here in the campaign literature from international socialism, the real enemy around climate change is the capitalist system, but putting profits before the lives of billions of humans on the planet. And the allies in this fight against climate change are the millions of workers, working people around the world who have no vested interest in the system that prioritizes profit. And Naomi Klein's book, Capitalism versus Climate, is exactly seeing climate change in this way. As she says in her book, I realize the science of global warming <coughs> could be a catalyst for forms of social and economic justice in which I already believe. So for Klein coming late to climate change, as she admits, climate change <coughs> was actually exactly the narrative, was exactly the story, was exactly the resource that she could take uh, in order to uh, promote and to launch this challenge on a particular political <coughs> economic order. Or we could maybe see climate change as a significant key for the Anthropocene. Actually what climate change is, is standing in for this new idea uh, that has been in circulation now for 15 years, that the force of human action in the world on the planet has taken us into a new geological epoch. And so we go from, the, from climate change into the Anthropocene. Climate change is giving expression to this idea of the Anthropocene. Humans are changing the atmosphere uh, in ways that we have not previously known and therefore are displaying the capabilities of humans to change the very functioning of the planet itself. Climate change stands in for this Anthropocenic uh, narrative. And of course, one would need to start, for all of these, in, uh, in fact, all these synecdoches, one would need to one want to start digging in and exploring a little bit more deeply about what is implied in all of these. But I illustrate, I'm using these illustrations for different ways in which people are passing judgment on the facts, ways in which people are constructing meaning around <coughs> climate change. And you will not find these, you will not read these synecdoches 
and the narratives that underpin them, you not find these in the pages of the IPCC report. You can <coughs> simply read the science and discover which of these meanings are true. You have to pass judgment. You have to make your own intervention in order to discover which of these four examples and others besides are in fact true. And so thirdly, in, in this talk, the third part then, having made this argument that the risks, climate risks are underdetermined by science, which requires, in any case, us to pass judgment, this then exposes the multiple goals that are in play when climate change is debated and argued over in political life. That there are many goals that actors and advocates will bring into the foreground. At the one level, of course, one could say, well, there is an ultimate goal, uh, and that has been adjudicated upon by the world's government through the multilateral negotiations in Copenhagen and Cancun, and we'll see it's repeated as well in Paris. The goal of climate change policy is to keep global temperature below 2 degrees. So at one level you can say there aren't many goals, well at least if there are many goals, there's one overarching goal. Well, um, that may be true, we'll see how that two degree goal plays out, but even if we accept that level of political discourse around two degrees, we need to recognise that below that there are many different competing goals from other vested and advocacy interests. So the goals of climate change might actually be around uh, intervening in order to secure global economic growth at 3% per annum for the next 200 years, as implied in the Stone Review. Actually, the goal of climate policy intervention is to secure climate justice, to secure it now, as the campaign slogan would say. Actually, what climate change intervention is about, is in, in, in terms of adaptation, is to protect those people and places that matter to us from dangerous weather. Or maybe the goal of climate change is to secure the next technological transition to a low carbon economy. Or even to take away the um, drive towards ever greater material consumption or throughput. Or in the Dark Mountain Project, this cultural expression here in the UK in the last few years, even the goal of climate change intervention, policy intervention, is to decivilize our culture before we can re-civilize. We have to deconstruct what we have before we can reconstruct in a way that is in harmony with the planet. Or the SDGs, uh, or the MDGs transmuting later this year into the SDGs, these actually might be seen as the goals of climate policy intervention. My point is that these goals, these multiple goals that are in circulation, come out of the judgments that people are making on the facts of climate change. And they gain inspiration from particular narratives, from particular synecdoches. And of course, these goals, once they are exposed in this way, they are not all achievable in this world. You cannot achieve all of these goals simultaneously. You cannot have 2% per annum growth as measured through economic exchange and material exchange at the same time as having zero growth or degrowth. So it draws attention to where these disagreements actually end up. They end up in the goals that we bring to this phenomenon of climate change. And so this then is why one might begin to criticize the two degree target as an overarching meta goal. Uh, as uh, Amy Lewis uh, and Slard did in their uh, uh, commentary last year, the focus on a single target becomes an obstacle to policy making because it fails to recognize the diversity and values and risk perceptions of people around the world. Two degrees as a goal, hides everything really that is actually quite critical in political action in the world.
So, where do we go from here? So what way forward? This is then this final part of the, the lecture. What is the, uh, the way forward if indeed it is true that the risks are understood by science, that the passing of judgment on these facts takes us in lots of different directions with multiple and are very often conflicting goals. Well, one way of thinking of the way forward would be to uh, pick up on uh, this type of uh, uh, program, the aspirational uh, program that came out of Rio Plus 20 uh, under the rubric of the world we want from the UN and world leaders, gathering priorities of people from every corner of the world. This project will build a collective vision to plan a new development agenda launching in 2015. One that is based on the aspirations uh, of uh, all citizens. These aspirations to be all inclusive, to create this collective vision by listening to the aspirations uh, of all citizens. But I wonder how achievable this collective vision uh, really is. If we really do have different goals and aspirations, if we really do pass judgment uh, in different ways uh, on these scientific facts, then we do not all move together in this world. Uh, and it, uh, so a critique of this sort of approach uh, is very nicely illustrated in this uh, article by uh, Gwen Blue and Jenny Medlock uh, uh, last year in, an article in the Journal of Science and Culture, they went back and explored the uh, intervention made by the Danish government in the run-up to COP15 in Copenhagen back in 2009. This exercise in collecting the aspirations of all citizens <coughs> around climate change. It was called Worldwide Views on Global Warming, coordinated by the Danish uh, Board of Technology an exercise uh, in, in trying to uh, give voice to citizens from many different constituencies and, and countries around the world. Uh, and what Blue and Medlock did, where they went back into the transcripts and into the uh, responses that came through this multi-level uh, process, and what they concluded was that actually what was going on here was an example of what they call a passive form of scientific citizenship, shorn of the image of a citizen which had geographical, cultural, or political, uh, political particularity. What they meant here was that, that the very way in which this participatory exercise was framed already closed down the possibilities of what these voices could actually say in response to that consultation. The particular geographies of where these citizens came from, the particular cultures, the particular politics, the particular <coughs> ethical <coughs> convictions was not allowed to be given expression in this consultation and exercise. And instead, what Blue and Medlock would argue for is that where was the chance for people to question the framing of climate change in this exercise? or the visions uh, and the options that they were uh, asked to select between. Whose interests actually underlay this very consultation exercise? And where were the spaces to develop alternative proposals and visions? And as they conclude, the danger here is that the more universal and standardized scientific discourse becomes, for global policy purposes, the more responsive, formal participatory initiatives, such as this, need to be able to give expression to diverse uh, public meanings. So the point here is that citizens can very quickly find themselves being disciplined in ways of being consulted and ask. 
Or a, a third way forward um, uh, might be simply to do this, which is what the Earth League, uh, a, a self-announced collective of uh, leading intellectuals around the world have done in their publication just a few weeks ago. And here they proclaimed, here are scientists speaking with one voice, leading scientific intellectuals speaking with one voice to the world. This is the world we must have. And they go through their nine points, or their eight points, laying down unconditional necessities. Governments must, the carbon budget must, we need to, every country must. We must unleash, we need a strategy, we must safeguard, we must realize. So here, the voice from, I don't know where, the voice from above, the voice from nowhere, the voice from the great human <coughs> scientific intellects of the world, telling planet Earth, the leaders of our nations, what they must do. It's all about what we, whoever we here might be, uh, and the governments must do. So, I'm not convinced by these ways forward, given the challenges and risks and dilemmas that climate change presents to us. And so I want to suggest then um, an alternative way of thinking about this, which is to invest in the preconditions for making the world that we want. Uh, and it seems to me there are four uh, elements to this that I want to suggest um, <clears throat> to understand the place of science in democracy, to draw attention to the nature of the political institutions and political processes that we have, to emphasize the need for spaces of encountering the other. Where can you encounter those with whom you disagree. And then the idea uh, of virtuous characters. Now this clearly is a normative agenda. What I'm arguing and suggesting is distinctly normative. It's saying that these four preconditions are ones that themselves will lend to a process which is creating a world that I'd prefer, presumably, to live in than if these preconditions did not exist. So I'm not uh, escaping any normative claims here, but I'm drawing attention to placing the normative claim on the processes, on the preconditions, rather than to, as the Earth League intellectuals have done, making the normative claim about what that end point should be. So this is the focus on means uh, rather than ends. And the point is, at least in, the, in my worldview, is that the end is unachievable. We cannot manage, we cannot regulate, we cannot engineer the world in order to achieve certain desirable goals. That is beyond our capabilities, either individually or collectively. So actually for me, the most we can do is to try to ensure that we have these preconditions in the best possible shape that they can be. And then the world will unfold and develop uh, in the various ways that it will. But at least we'll have <laughs> done what we can to ensure that uh, it has been created and shaped in the right way. So quickly, just to explore what I mean by these, uh, putting science in its place. <coughs> um, uh, again, we could spend a whole lecture on this, um, uh, and I won't do so, but it's uh, simply to make a, make a point, <coughs> um, which I've made already in various ways in this talk, is that science cannot be decisive. Uh, uh, scientific knowledge can never be the decisive guide to moral or political or ethical action in the world. Um, so understanding this relationship then between science and democracy, when and how do experts speak, when and how do, do citizens speak back? 
And where does the, the locus of decision making actually take place? It is not that, as Pachari put it, understanding the science of climate change uh, is uh, the decisive uh, intervention. And the dangers of consensus processes around science, as Nico Stör has put, <laughs> is that the focus then becomes uh, on the making of the consensus which then guides political action, rather than on the constitutive social, political, and economic uh, processes uh, that actually bring uh, decisions into the foreground. Uh, and a quote also here from someone well known to many of you, of course, from Melissa uh, Leach, uh, taken from her sort of <coughs> her reflections uh, from a couple of years ago. Um, after one or two of her interactions with the UN process uh, following on uh, the Rio summit uh, in, in 2012. And she reflects, is there a contradiction between the world of the Anthropocene and democracy? The Anthropocene with its associated concepts of boundaries and hard limits encourages a focus on clear single goals and solutions. It is co-constructed with ideas of scientific authority and incontrovertible evidence with a closing down of uncertainty, or at least the reduction in the clear manageable risks and consensual measures. There are dangers. These are some of the dangers, it seems to me, of putting science too much into the driving seat. Yes, scientific knowledge is crucial, but we need to put science in its place, in its appropriate place, within a democratic uh, society. So therefore, we also secondly need to ensure that we pay attention and invest in the political institutions and processes that we want to see within the societies in which we live. And so normatively, I would say I would want to invest those in forms that promote democratic forms of life than in theocratic or autocratic or technocratic societies. And in democracies, the critical thing here is about the necessity of agonistic debate, of argument, of conflict, of disagreement. And it's only by cultivating those processes in a democracy will the conditions of trust be created. Only will then those who hold power be able to be held uh, accountable. And so this is where we need to invest in these uh, preconditions. Uh, and this, of course, is partly taken in inspiration from uh, the theorists uh, like Chantal Mouffe. And related to this is the third point about spaces of encounter. For an agonistic society, for a truly democratic society to function, we need to be able to gather, to congregate, to hear those with whom we disagree. And here this is a challenge for a world, a society, which is in many ways actually putting obstacles and barriers in the way of these spaces of encounter. Um, and various, uh, again, communication scholars and um, political theorists have written uh, uh, about this here, uh, two communication scholars in the States, and an interesting uh, thought piece uh, on this. Encountering disagreements in one's social network is a good thing. It promotes participation in a number of civically relevant outcomes. And yet the problem we have in our new communication platforms and technologies is that we are closing our ears. We are being excluded from those places where we can encounter uh, the other. As they go on to explore, the effect of the internet and new social media is to actually reinforce partisan divides. It's to actually close ourselves off from encountering people who may see the world differently to us. It's the idea of the dangers of, of echo chambers, of information cocoons, or as Kaz Sunstein has written in his book, Going to Extremes, 
how like minds unite and divide is that we find ourselves being pushed into the corners of the discursive space where we become ever more convinced of our own superiority and our, our own hold on the truth. So cultivating and investing in these spaces <coughs> for diverse encounters seems to me one of these uh, preconditions. And then finally, uh, virtuous characters. <coughs> and, and here, while well, I'm uh, delving into the area of uh, moral philosophy uh, and ethics. And it seems here that um, there's something rich to explore and to promote uh, in this uh, broad arena that we might think of as virtue ethics. So this is different from utilitarianism or from rights-based approaches or from deontological approaches that are Kantian, picking up the ancient notion of virtue acting and living coherently and consistently in accord with the purpose for which we understand our place to be on this planet. Now there are different ways here in which you can take uh, virtue ethics, for sure. I think one of the things that I'm attracted to about it is it gives much greater weight to the interpretative value of community, of humans in relationship with each other, rather than the more abstracted, rational uh, arguments uh, of utilitarianism and Kantian deontological ethics. For virtue ethicists, the critical thing is about how people live in these communities to cultivate the virtuous individual. And for me, coming from a Christian uh, tradition, for me here there are resources uh, around this particular um, precondition that I think are of significant interest. And here I'm just drawing from one uh, example from a, a progressive Christian theologist, a theologian, Tom Wright, uh, who's uh, spent a lot of time thinking about virtue, both in ethical, political, and theological terms. And for him, he talks about the virtuous circle for promoting the virtuous character, where, where, where social practices, where being in community, where telling stories that are inspirational, where promoting exemplars, of individuals whom we can emulate. And from the Christian tradition, of course, these authoritative benchmarks, if you will, that come from holy scriptures. And what is interesting when I'm thinking about this is that we can very easily transpose this particular type of Christian analysis of virtue characters into other more secular or even uh, atheistic contexts. All we simply do is we replace the voice, if you like, from outside with um, whatever other notions of authoritative intervention one's, one might be consistent in one's worldview, whether that be reason, whether that be evidence, or some other faith-based source of authority. But actually the same dimensions in this virtuous circle still actually, for me, carry significant weight. The idea of uh, ritualistic social practices, of working through how to act in the world through community, the power of narrative and story, the uh, exemplars, the motivational exemplars of people uh, who we can emulate. Uh, and so um, this little uh, manifesto for atheists from Alain de Botton, a philosopher, uh, very explicitly played on the idea of virtue from an atheistic perspective. Ten virtues for the modern age. So here, for me, there's an interesting, um, certainly there's an even interesting overlap, if not a convergence, between these different traditions thinking about how virtue, uh, the virtuous character, 
uh, can be cultivated. So those are my four preconditions. Um, putting science in its place, investing in appropriate political institutions and processes, cultivating spaces of encounter, and promoting the notion of virtuous character. And then this does not itself then, of course, determine what the outcome will be. This is the, the very point. But what it does, it lays down the right ways in which we act, argue, decide, and intervene in the world. And that might produce a better world uh, than a world that simply is focused on the ends rather than pays attention to the means. Thank you.